guys are enjoying this cooler weather we're having? Are you enjoying this? How many's already ready for springtime? <laughs> You're not going to get there anytime soon, all right? So it's going to be a while. Uh, it is so good to see you. And if you want to get out your message notes, we're going to jump right into the final part of our series entitled God of the Underdogs. And uh, this is the sixth and final part of our series. And I have really, really enjoyed it. And my hope is that after this series, you'll never look at the word underdog the same way ever again. And you'll realize that even if everyone else thinks of you as an underdog, God has a plan for your life. And I've said this throughout the entire series. And so if you're getting tired of it, don't worry. This is the last time I'll say this. But if you know it, you can say it with me. And that is this, that if you're in here and you are the smartest, you are the most beautifulest, you are the most handsomest, uh, everything always seems to go your way. And gosh darn it, everybody just really likes you. I've got good news for you. If you know it, say it with me. God can still use you. Yes, yes, he can. And God's hopefully spoken to you and is going to speak to you to get today in this series. However, this series is primarily not for those perfect people in here. This series is for all the rest of us, all those of us who don't have it all figured out, who sometimes feel like that they're, the odds are really stacked against us, that we, we just seem like we don't always get the breaks, that we, sh we, we drew out the short straw out of it, and that honestly, seems like that the more we try, the worse things get. If that's you, I want you to know that God has something to say to you today. And if you want to look at the series scripture, I'm going to do it in the, the Brandon's unauthorized version today. And that is, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so many examples in God's word of the life of faith, let us throw away all the excuses that slow us down and let us continue moving forward with what God has called each one of us to do. And the big idea of this series has been that there are people all throughout God's word who if you were to define them, the best definition would have been an underdog. People who did not look like they had it all together. People who you would have never assumed that God would do anything significant with their life. But many of these people, God used them to alter the course of history. And if God can use them in their generation, he can definitely use us today. And so as we've been talking about the, the definition of an underdog, just in case you've forgotten, is an underdog is a person or people group that everybody expects to lose. And I've tried to be really careful with you throughout this series to help you understand that when I call you an underdog, I'm not calling you a loser, okay? As a matter of fact, you may be winning in 99.9% .9 of your life. Everything is going really, really well in almost every area. However, everybody in here has a private battle that nobody else knows about. Everybody has at least one secret. Everybody has at least one struggle, one, one issue. And if you're honest, even if it's just 1%, there is this part inside of you that identifies with the idea of an underdog because you feel like in that one area, you just feel expected to lose. You just feel like that that one's just not going to work out. Everything else is going to work out fine. But if I'm honest, this one area, I just feel expected to lose. And I think that's why we all understand underdog stories. And that throughout this series, I've been sharing with you uh, all of my favorites and uh, stories from, about underdogs. And thank you so much for all of you who sent me all of your suggestions. They are amazing. As a matter of fact, y'all have added to my book and movie watching list because there were so many stories I'd never even heard of. But the one to finish on that I think kind of goes along with our message is how many of you have ever seen this movie or collection of movies, Lord of the Rings? How many spent 20 hours of your life, you know, watching the director's cut, 100 hours of your life? How, how many's ever tried to make it through a Lord of the Rings marathon and made it, okay? Uh, I, I've tried several times. I barely make it halfway through the second movie before I realize I could be doing better things with my life right now. <laughs> and I started, because I love the movies, but they are long. And I even, I've read the books and that took even longer. There's not enough pictures in those books, uh, but those are really, it's a really, really good story. And especially if you're an underdog, because the, the main character, Frodo Baggins, is probably one of the greatest underdogs in all of literary uh, history. I mean, if you've not seen the movie, I don't understand you at all, but I'm going to tell you that Frodo Baggins is like literally one of the least likely to succeed, and he's got a ring, and his goal in this journey is to take the ring all the way to Mount Doom and drop it in a volcano because there's a Dark Lord Sauron who wants it. 
And if he can get a hold of it, he takes over everything, okay? And so what I love about it too, though, if you've ever looked at it through the lens of an underdog, is all throughout the story, the chances of Frodo actually doing this are extremely slim. Like you can look at almost all the main characters and at some point in the story, they all basically say, you know this really isn't going to work, right? <laughs> I mean, we're, well, all we can do is try, but honestly, I don't think it's going to succeed. I mean, the chances are so slim that Frodo can beat all the forces that are against him that it really seems like a fool's errand, but we're going to try. Well, if you've seen the movie, you know at the last moment they win. Praise the Lord, all right? And Middle Earth is saved. It's awesome. But here's the question I have for you. How many of us in here today can really identify with the idea of Frodo Baggins and the idea of, I've got this plan, I've got this idea, I've got this, this task or this goal, and sure, it's possible, but it just seems really unlikely. You ever just kind of had that in your, in your heart and your mind? Like, listen, I know it's possible. Like, I, I know that it's possible to raise godly, independent kids. I know it's possible, but man, if you look at mine, <laughs> it seems so very unlikely. I know it's possible for my spouse and I to stay married. I, I know it's possible, but have you seen him lately? <laughs> you know, have you seen her lately? And it's possible, but man, it's going to be really, really hard. Or, or I, know what it's, I know what it's like to, to live a faithful Christian life and to pursue God and to, to serve others. I know it's possible, but man, it seems so difficult that it seems like I'm trying to take a ring to Mount Doom. I just don't know. And, and honestly, when it comes to what God is really calling you to do and pushing you to do, maybe you've believed the last underdog lie we're going to talk about in this series. And that is that, yeah, God can do something with my life. But if I'm honest, it just seems like my chances are just too slim. Like, I, I know that God wants to use me to make a difference in my family, where I work, in my generation with the people around. I, I know that. I know, like, I, I believe you. I'm sold out to the idea. I just think it's too slim that he would actually ever want to use me. And if you believe that, if you're, if you're honest and just say, you know what, I just, I'm not in the movies. I, I don't have all of the breaks. And I don't have someone writing the script of my life. And so, so I mean, I don't always, so it just, it's just way too slim to really think that this underdog could really make a difference. If that's how you feel, then I want you to know you're not alone. And the person we're going to talk about from God's Word today can definitely identify with you. And her name is Queen Esther. How many has ever heard of Queen Esther? There's been a lot of movies and books uh, written about her. She has this amazing story because Queen, Queen Esther, I mean, she was a nobody from nowhere. I mean, she was an orphan. She was a refugee. All the odds were stacked against her that she would even be a footnote in history. However, God used her in an amazing way to actually save an entire nation. And the Jewish people actually still celebrate a holiday based on what she did. And what she did also cascaded into so many other things that has changed the life of some of us who are sitting here today. Someone who, with the chances were so slim, we would even know her name, actually has a book of the Bible named after her. And so we're going to talk about her story. And honestly, one of my favorite things about her story is the fact that if you read through the book of Esther, we're, we're only going to hit the extreme highlights today. Like we don't have enough time the, to get into completely. It's amazing. But one of the things I love the most is that God's name is actually not even mentioned in the book of Esther. You ever notice that? Like God is not named by name in the entire, it's the only book of the Bible where God's name is actually not mentioned. However, you can see his fingerprints all through the story and all through the life of Esther. And my hope is it will bring hope to you that if you're in a place in your life and you feel like that God's so distant from you that it's almost like you hadn't even heard his name in a long time as far as in him moving in your life to realize that even if you can't always see God moving in your life, he is moving. And then one day you'll look back and you'll realize that he never left you, but he's actually been guiding you all along the way. And we're going to see that in the story of Queen Esther. So we're going to jump into this. There's a whole lot to cover. And we're just going to walk right through the story. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull out as we go along four different lessons that we can learn. That if you feel like an underdog in here today, and you feel like that, sure, maybe God could use me, but the chances are so very slim. There's four things I think God wants to speak to us through her story. So as we jump into it, there's four major characters 
you need to understand about her story. Okay, so I'm going to tell you these two so you'll, you'll kind of know what they are. First one is King Xerxes. I know that's not how you think you would say his name, by how it's spelled, but it's King Xerxes. And if you've seen the movie 300, that evil king, that's the guy. Okay, all right. And that's actually uh, what they... Uh, acted like he looked like. That was a, a sculpture made, uh, King Xerxes. And he's not a good guy. He, he is a bad person, uh, but he is the king in this story. His second in command, the prime minister of Persia, the, the kingdom that he ruled, which spanned three continents, the second in command was Haman. He was second in charge of all of Persia. Then you've got Esther, who is the main person of, of our story today. And then you've got Mordecai, who was Esther's uncle. And so we're going to talk about these and how God moved in their life. So to set the story up for you, this all happened between 480 and 460 B.C. It was about 480 years before the birth of Christ. And the nation of Israel had been a kingdom at that point for a few hundred years. And then the Babylonian Empire came into the Middle East, or the, the western part of the Middle East. They're from uh, Iraq and Iran. And they came in and they captured the nation of Israel. And what they would do is when they captured a nation, they would take all the valuable goods and most of the people and take them back to their land to be slaves. And so that's what they did with the Israelites. They took a majority of the population back to modern-day Iraq and Iran to be slaves. And while they were there, uh, the, uh, another kingdom, Persia, came in and overthrew the Babylonian Empire, by, led by Xerxes' dad, Darius. And so they took over all of Babylon and then actually let a few of the Israelites go back to the nation of Israel. But many of them were still there in what is now Persia. Well, Darius gets old, Xerxes takes over, and that's where we have our story. And so it opens up, the Bible says that at that time, after uh, Xerxes had took over, that there was a man, a Jewish man, whose name was Mordecai. And his family had been among those who were with the king Jehoiakim of Judah who had been exiled. So they were the ones that were taken captive all the way back to what is now Persia. And this man had a very beautiful and lovely cousin named Hadassah who was called Esther. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. So we find Esther at the beginning of the story, and she's in a really bad place. So she's already a refugee, which makes her in this time a, a second-class citizen. She is the, the, the children of who probably were slaves. Not only that, but she is a woman. And in this culture of the time was devastating if you didn't have a family. What's even worse now is that she is an orphan, which means she is at the bottom of the bottom. People in prison were better taken care of than people in her situation. But she has a family member who's willing to take her in. And the first lesson that we can learn, if you're taking notes, is write this down with me, to never call serving others a little thing. You know, I feel like an underdog, and I feel like my chances of making a big impact in my life are too slim. Well, never look at serving others as a little thing. Because Mordecai sees this family member, and he can't change everything, but he can do something for her. And isn't it important to realize, especially in our culture, that when it comes to serving somebody else, that's not a little thing, but it's actually so very important. Because we live in a culture that if we're honest, it really kind of, it, it kind of grooms us to be very me conscious. Like, you, you know, you've got, you know, uh, businesses that, you know, the, the whole slogan is have it your way. You know, you've got, you know, even the wonderful Chick-fil-A, no matter what you tell them, they say, my pleasure. I mean, you could tell them their food stinks and they would say, my pleasure. <laughs> it's all, which it doesn't, which would be weird because it's amazing. But the, the point of it is they're always trying to just make you feel good. And honestly, if you're not careful, what happens is, is our culture creates a what's in it for me kind of attitude in a lot of us. And, and we don't mean to be that way. It's just we get so wrapped up in it that we start looking at serving others as a little thing or a means to an end to help ourselves. As a matter of fact, uh, several weeks ago, we had a serve day, and we had an opportunity when we could go and we could serve our city. And we had someone who was really new to our church, and they didn't mean it in a bad way. They just didn't know. And we were giving people opportunities to serve. And this person came up to me and said, so are we going to get paid for this? I was like, no, you're not getting paid for this. You're serving somebody else. No, be quiet and go get on a team. You know? but, and I get it, though, because there's this idea of what's in it for me. 
I, I love the idea of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was talking about uh, the, the Samaritan, uh, Good Samaritan story. If you don't know that story, it's a story that Jesus told about how there was this guy who was beat up and left on the side of the road. And three people walked right by him and wouldn't help him. And finally, the fourth person came by and did help him. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, the first three said, what will happen to me if I help him? But the fourth one said, what will happen to him if I don't? And so it was this idea that I can't do everything, but I can do something. And you never know when you serve somebody what difference it will make. You know, we, we always wait for the big home run, but what God is asking us to do is just keep swinging the bat, keep serving somebody else. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it like this. It says, when you, I tell you the truth that when you did this for the least of these of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And so the first lesson we can learn as underdogs is never look at serving somebody else as something small and insignificant. Because you have no idea when you serve somebody what God may use it or that person to do, what he may set them up to do later. It reminds me of a guy named Mordecai Ham, another Mordecai that lived and back in, the, uh, back in the 40s and 50s. And if you don't know who Mordecai Ham is, I wouldn't be surprised. He's, he's fairly unknown in the history books. And uh, he was a tent preacher. How many ever been to a tent church service? Yeah, a few of you, most of you not. So what they would do is they would go to these, these towns and they put up this tent. They put sawdust on the floor and, and chairs and all this stuff. And they would just have church services for anybody who wanted to come. And uh, Mordecai wasn't real good at it. <laughs> I mean, just to be honest, in the eyes of men, he, he wasn't really good at it. He didn't have a lot of people attend his services, not a lot of people uh, really giving their lives to Christ. And if you were to look at it from the outward, you would think he needed to go do something else. And, but he kept doing it and he kept doing it. And he went to this one town and he set up the tent and told people about it. And only a small handful of people showed up. And if it had been anybody else, they would have said, well, is it really worth it? I mean, it's just a few people. Let's just cancel it. But instead, he had that idea that never think of serving someone as a little thing. So he went ahead and had, they had church, and he did the best he could. And at the end of the service, at this small handful, only one person, one young man, came down to the front to give his life to Jesus. And if it had been anybody else, he would have said, man, I worked so hard for one person. Just forget about it. But instead, he said, you know what? I can't do everything, but I can help this one. And I'm not going to say that serving this one person is a little thing. So he went and he led that person to Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm one of thousands that's really glad that he did because that young man's name is Billy Graham. <laughs> and so you never know what serving one person might do for a nation. So never look at serving someone as a little thing. How did Mordecai know? He had no idea that by giving Esther a place to live, he was later saving an entire nation. So the first thing you need to understand is never call serving someone else a little thing. And so she moves in with Mordecai, time passes, and now we get to the next part of the story because remember Xerxes is not a great guy, but he is the king. And he decides to have a party for all of his officials. And they go and they have their party and, and he's bragging about how beautiful his queen, Queen Vashti is. And he has to kind of back up his words. So he orders her to come to the party wearing her crown and nothing else, <laughs> just, just wearing a crown so everybody can see how beautiful she is. And of course, I didn't say he was a good guy, all right? He's a bad guy, all right? And uh, she obviously refuses. And so he's like, all right, you're not going to do what I tell you to do. You're no longer queen. He, he deposes her as queen. And that's, he's in his right to do that, even though it's horrible. But now he's got a problem. He needs a queen. And so his officials and advisors come to him and say, we've got a great idea. Let's have the first season of The Bachelor. <laughs> let's go ahead and, and let's get you a new wife, all right? And, and so we're going to get all the eligible bachelorettes. Let's get all of the, the, the eligible maidens and let's get them together. And they're going to spend one night with you. And whichever one you like the most, that'll become your new queen. Like I said, not a nice guy. Well, Esther is beautiful and intelligent. And so she, she gets in the competition, which was a year of preparation. Six months of spa treatment, praise the Lord, and then six months of learning how to act like a dignitary. And so finally her moment comes, and she goes, and, and he is so impressed with her, how beautiful she, are, she is, how smart she is, that he just stops the contest. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one for me. And so she becomes queen, this orphan that had no chance of even being a footnote in history, becomes 
the queen of the largest empire in the world at the time. There was one catch, though. Mordecai told her, don't tell anybody that you are a Jew. And so time goes on and everything is good until a guy named Haman comes on the scene. And Haman loved the limelight. Like he loved being a second in command. The Bible says that he would travel all throughout the city of Susa, which was the capital. And everywhere he would go, people had to bow down in respect. Well, Mordecai must have knew that, man, he had a black heart. He was an evil guy. And so when everybody would bow down, Mordecai wouldn't do anything. He'd stand there respectfully, but he wouldn't bow and pay respects to Haman. Well, Haman noticed this, and he decided not only was he going to kill Mordecai, but he wanted to kill all the Jews because he was so frustrated that Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. So he goes to uh, Xerxes and says, he approaches him and said, there is a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. It is not in the king's interest to let them live. This is a bad dude. All right? He doesn't just want to kill Mordecai. He wants to kill everybody. All right? And then he says this. He says, issue a decree that they will be destroyed, and I will give the money to pay for it. I'm going to give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the treasure. In other words, you give me permission to kill them all, and I'll pay for it. So the king, because he's going, I ain't got to pay for it, confirmed his decision by removing his signet ring off and giving it to Haman, the enemy of the Jews. So listen what his plan is. So a decree was written exactly as Haman dictated, and in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring, Dispatches were sent and swift messengers all throughout the provinces, giving the order that all J Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. So it's like kill you, kill you, and then kill you some more. All right. And then not only that, but in order to incentivize all the neighbors to do this, all the property of the Jews were going to be given to those who did the killing. Rough stuff, all right? So the way it read was, is all the Jewish people on a certain day were going to have an opportunity. In other words, you could kill any Jewish person and not get in trouble for it. And as a matter of fact, if you killed them, you got their property. That's a bad day, all right? Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa fell into confusion. Most likely because there was a lot of people there that were slaves who were also Jewish. So not a a not a really good day if you're a Jewish person, which leads us, leads us to the second lesson we've got to learn. If we feel like we're an underdog and the chances are so, too slim for us to make a difference, is number one, to realize that serving is not a little thing. It's a good thing. The second thing is to realize opposition is inevitable. Opposition is inevitable. And honestly, throughout this series, we've brought this up over and over again because you've got to understand that if you want to do anything for God in your life, it's not going to come easy. There's always going to be people who are going to disagree with what you want to do and what you feel like God is calling you to do. And honestly, we have to understand that the enemy of your soul, he is not nice and he doesn't play by the rules. We have folks who get, you get so upset when bad things happen. Well, you know why bad things happen? It's because your enemy, the devil, he's not playing by any of your rules. He's playing to win. And so when bad things happen, we just have to understand it's going to happen. And matter of fact, God's word says this. It says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you were going through as if something weird was going on. It's like, no, 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 it's not weird when the enemy tries to stop you from doing something for God. It's kind of his thing. <laughs> it's kind of what he, he's going to do. And, and if, if Jesus, when he was on the earth, if he's constantly had to struggle with the devil and struggle with bad attitudes of people that were supposed to help him, then it shouldn't come to any surprise to us that there's going to be well-meaning people who are going to do bad things in our life because opposition is inevitable. And we have to understand that because how many times have we thought that because we experience opposition, God must not be with us? Like, have you ever had one of those days when you're like, you know what, I read my devotion this morning. I listened to my Bible on the way to work. I, I prayed. Why are my kids acting like this? <laughs> it's not fair. Why, why is my boss yelling at me? I, have I not been good enough? Well, maybe it's not because you haven't been good enough. Maybe it's an opportunity for God to do something good through you. Maybe you see an opposition, but God sees an opportunity. So maybe instead of looking at the opposition as you're doing something wrong, 
maybe that opposition is a sign that God wants to use you to do something great. Because that's definitely what happened in the life of Esther. Because when this starts to go out, Mordecai finds out about it, and he is just inconsolable. He just, he, he gets in, the, you know, in the, the sackcloth and the ashes, you know, and he's, he's just doing the thing, and, and he's just bad. And so Esther sends word to him to stop that because it's horrible and gross and sad. And he's like, you don't understand. Like, in a year from now, there's this certain day, and the king is signed into, into law that everybody that's a Jew, that's a Jew is going to die. Can you go to the king and beg him to change his mind? Well, Esther's like, I mean, yeah, but there's a problem. Like, I can't just go to the king. And she says this. It says, she told Mordecai, all the officials know that anyone who appears before the king without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds up his gold scepter and the king has not called for me in 30 days. Now, this was the girl that he couldn't have enough of so much that he made her the queen. But either he's gotten bored with her or something else is going on. But for whatever reason, he has not invited her to be in his presence for over 30 days. And so she's going, something's not right. For some reason, he's not interested in me anymore. So maybe there's got to be another way. But Mordecai says, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace that you're insulated from this. You're going to get killed too. But who knows if perhaps all of this happened, you were made queen just because God knew what was coming. Is it possible that this opposition is just an opportunity for God to do something amazing? And so Esther hears it. And so she says, okay, go gather all the Jews and fast for me for three days. And my maids and I will do the same. And then though it is against the law, I will go see the king. And if I must die, I must die. And so the third thing we need to understand is, number one, is to never see serving as a little thing because you never know what God can use to make a big difference. The second thing is that there's always going to be outward opposition to what God is trying to do in your life. The third one is that there's always going to be a dangerous king between you and making a difference. And most of the time, his name will be fear. Most of the time. You're going to have opposition from the outside, there's also going to be opposition on the inside. Fear, fear of failure. What if I decide to step out and do something for God and it doesn't work out the way I have it planned in my mind? Fear of provision. What, what if I don't have what it takes to make it happen? Fear of rejection. What if, what if everybody else doesn't agree with me and, and they decide instead to, to, to kind of go against me? What, is it, have you ever noticed that the greatest opportunities come along at the worst timing? <laughs> you ever noticed that? Like, you, you know, great opportunities hardly ever come along when everything's going great. But usually it's when you're busy, when you're stressed, all this other stuff. That's when great opportunities seem to come along. And that's exactly what's happened to Esther. There is this opportunity now that God has put her to a place where the chances seem so slim that God could ever use her. But now she's in an opportunity where God can do something amazing if she can have enough courage to simply take the next step. And God's word teaches us that he is actually not the one who gives us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And is it possible in our lives that God does not bless us just to be blessed, but he blesses us so that we can be a blessing to other people? That God didn't put her in the, the palace just a few yards away from where the king was gonna sit just so that she could just enjoy luxury? but so that when the moment came, she could step in and be an advocate for those who couldn't advocate for themselves. It's an amazing idea that God put a Jewish person right there close to the king so that when the enemy decided to destroy them, there was somebody ready to step in and make a difference. How do we not know that God has not put you right where you are? Because right where you are is where you need to be so that when the time comes, you can make an amazing difference. And so maybe we're blessed so that we can be a blessing. And that's what happens to Esther. She fasts for three days and for three nights. And if you've ever fasted for three days and three nights, you're ready to walk it toward death already. And so maybe that was part of her motivation. And so she goes, and you can imagine she's entering into, you know, the palace. And maybe there were some people there who really liked her, who knew that he hadn't called for her. It's like, Esther, where are you going? I'm going to see Xerxes. Well, you know he hasn't called for you. I know I'm going anyway. You know what they do to people that he doesn't, you know, if he's having a bad day, I know, but I got to go. 
And so she, she walks in, she's there, and on the other side on his throne is Xerxes, and he looks at her, and, and she kind of holds her breath because he's kind of looking at her. And, and finally he smiles and, and puts his scepter up, which stops the guards who are probably already on their way to her, and he stops them. And he looks at her and he smiles, and he invites her in, and he says this. He says, what do you want, Queen Esther? I will give it to you, even if it's up to half my kingdom. And Esther replied, like, here's the moment, right? This is, this is the chance when she gets to stand up in front of everybody as this great orator and talk about why the Jewish people should not be put to death. Here's the moment. She says, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for the king. Not the most eloquent speech. All right? I mean, this is the moment. She, I mean, you imagine Xerxes is there. All the officials are there. Haman is there. This is her moment, all right? This, this is the climax of the movie when the, you know, the, the protagonist stands up and gives this amazing speech, right? And she says, let's have lunch. <laughs> That's what she says. But, you know, honestly, the, the more I thought about this, the more that speaks to me. Because what it said to me, and this is our, our, our fourth lesson, that is, that our job is simply that you do your best and let God do the rest. You do your best and let God do the rest. Let me, let me tell you why. Because she wasn't trained to be an orator. She, she wasn't trained to be a public speaker. She was trained to please the king. She spent a year of preparation knowing what the king liked and knowing how to make him happy. And in that time, in that culture, the queen was basically a glorified hostess. That's what she would do. She was in charge of keeping all, make sure everybody had what they needed. And she, that, those were her skills to make the king happy and to really to put on a good dinner. That's what she had. Can I tell you that God doesn't want to use you based on who you think you're supposed to be. He wants to use you exactly as you are because he knows who you are. Like, he, he knows. He, he, he's not waiting for you to become somebody else. Now, he's always working in your life, trying to make you the very best Christ follower you can be. But he wants to use you right now the way you are. Because you're only in charge of doing what you can do. It's God that does the miracle. And she knows, I can't save all the Jewish people. I, I, I can't, you know, I can't do that. You know what I can do? I can put on a really good lunch. I can impress the king. And then maybe God will open a door for something else in my life. The, the Bible says this. It says, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. What is it? All the things you can't? You know why? Because he's faithful. Well, what happens when I'm not faithful? He's still faithful. And he will do all the things that you can't do. And that's exactly what happened to Queen Esther. The Bible says that, that Haman and the king go to this banquet, and all, I mean, all the favorite foods so of the king was there. I mean, fried chicken and mashed potatoes. Hey, I'm from Alabama, okay? Uh, Pete's cobbler and apple pie. I mean, it's, it is a feast for a king, and she is an amazing hostess. She knows how to do her job well. And so they, they sit there, and they eat, and it's wonderful. And, and when they're done, the king pushes back from the table, kind of rubs his belly a little bit and says, all right, honey, that was amazing. What do you want? I'll give, I'll give you whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. And she says, you want to know what I want? Yes, I want to know what you want. It's what I want. Why don't you come back tomorrow? Let's do it again. I can do that. All right, let's come on back. And so they do. Comes back the next day. Next day, it's even better. It's filet mignon. As my wife said one time, filet mignon. <laughs> and baked potatoes and, and creme brulee. I mean, it's just even better than it was the day before. And they eat and they eat and they eat. And finally, he pushes back from the table. He's like, oh, baby, I'm going to gain so much weight. But I'm so happy. What do you want? I'll give you anything you want. You want to know what I want? Yes. I, what do you want? I want you to come back one more time tomorrow. I can get used to this. All right, I'll do it. Just doing what she knows how to do. Doing what she knows how to do. Not trying to be something she's not. She's just being the very best her that she can be. So finally, they go back on the third day. Haman's been bragging to everybody. The queen keeps inviting me to dinner. It's awesome. You know, and he's, he's, he's all whatever. And they get a third day, and oh my goodness, the third day, it is the best. It is taco night, which is my favorite. I mean, it is amazing, all right? They have the best food ever. And then he pushes back, and he's like, babe, I don't know how much more of this I can handle. This is amazing. What do you want? Do you want to know what I want? I'll give you anything, up to half my kingdom. What can I do for you? And then finally she says it. 
would you save my life and that of my people? Who's trying to kill you, baby? Who in the world would try to kill my queen? I mean, yeah, who, who in the world? And she points at Haman and says, that guy right there. He's not only trying to kill me, but all of my people because I'm a Jew. And all of a sudden, the king remembers what Haman had wanted to do, and he gets furious. How dare you try to kill my queen? And he gets so angry that he walks out of the room to collect himself, and Haman is panicking at this point. And so he runs up and grabs a hold of her to try to beg for his life. But as soon as he grabs onto her, the king walks back in and sees him grabbing onto her, and he thinks that Haman's trying to, trying to hurt her. So he gets even more angry, and he says, get out of my face. And Haman had built gallows where he was going to personally kill Mordecai. And he said, you know those gallows you built for, for Mordecai? I want you to go put him to death on those very gallows. And he goes and he puts Haman to death. And then he looks at Mordecai and Esther and he says this. He says, I have given Esther the property of Haman. And has been, uh, he has been impaled on a pole because he tried to destroy the Jews. Now go and send a message to all the Jews in the king's name, telling them whatever you want and seal it with the king's signet ring. Because once the king made a declaration, he couldn't take it back. His word was law. So he couldn't just say, you know, psych, you know, my bad. We're not gonna, they couldn't do that. But what, he, what they did do is they said, all the Jewish people have a right to arm themselves and to fight back and actually take over the other person's property. <laughs> and so instead of it being an onslaught and a slaughter, the Jews actually were able to be saved. And it was so good that they asked the king, can we do it again? <laughs> and so they did it again. And he was able to save, or she was able to save an entire nation, not because she was great, because she was great at doing what God had called her to do. She used a dinner to save a nation. You think your chances are too slim? Maybe it's because you're trying to do what God hasn't called you to do. Instead, what if you saw serving as no little thing, but realized that little is much when God is in it? So I'm just gonna do the best I can for whoever I can, because I never know what God's gonna do. And then to realize that opposition is inevitable. It's gonna happen. And so instead of running and hiding from it, I'm just gonna stand in the grace that God has given me. So this is what God's called me to do. And then when fear attacks your heart, you say, you know what? I don't have all the answers but I, I can take the next step. And then don't try to be something you're not, but instead realize that God has already given you everything you need to do everything he's called you to do. So stop trying to be the very best example of somebody else. Instead, say, God, these are the tools you've given me. So I'm gonna use them to make the biggest difference that I can. Because the truth is, is that God used Esther in a way that went even beyond that particular day, because they actually started a, a revival of a lot of the Jewish people longing to get back to Israel. And the king didn't realize it, but he had a cupbearer whose name was Nehemiah. And he was there, and maybe he saw everything that happened, and God began to put it on Nehemiah's heart that he needed to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And the book of Nehemiah teaches us that when he went before the king and queen, to talk about what he wanted to do, that they sent him on his mission. And so she was still there able to help continue the story of God. I don't know how long it is that all of us will be here. I don't know what God has planned for all of us. But while we are here, we are part of the story of God. And our job is to do the best we can and then to invest in those who are gonna carry the story on. And if you're in here and you feel like an underdog. You feel like, like we said in week one, that you, know, you just don't have the potential, or maybe you feel like you're too broken, or your past is too bad, or you're too insecure, or no one else notices your potential, or my chances are too slim. Maybe the verse you need to memorize is God's word that says, with man, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. That's the verse of an underdog, because they realize my job is not to change the world, my job is to take the next step, to do what's possible. And then it's God who does the impossible. Let's pray together this morning. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity 
to speak in front of so many amazing underdogs. And Lord, I say that with, with a great amount of confidence and honor because I know that you use underdogs to change our generation. And that for some of us, God, we have believed the lie for too long that said that we could never make a difference. But I pray you will help us to realize in this place that our job is to take the next step and allow you to make the difference through us. Right now our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I don't know what God may be doing in your life right now. And maybe he's speaking to you to maybe step up again, to try to make a difference with your life. You're not, you're not too broken. You're not used goods. You're not worthless. You have value. God has given you something to do. Maybe right now in this moment, you need to grab onto that again. Say, God, I'm sorry for thinking the chances were too slim that you could ever use me. But instead, I'm going to do the very best I can with what you've given me and allow you to do the impossible. I just want to give you a moment between you and the Lord. Maybe at some point someone told you that you could never make a difference, or maybe you just believed the lie yourself. It's time to realize that God is more for you than you can ever imagine. And he wants to use you just like you are to make a difference. And while your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, maybe you're talking to God about that. I want to talk to somebody else. That maybe you would be in here and you would say, there was a time when I believed that, but through time and trouble and unmet expectations and hurt feelings and bad people, I, I didn't realize it, but I walked away from my relationship with God. And now in this moment, I want to make things right. I want to allow him to come in and wash all that away. Can I tell you that's exactly what he wants to do? He's not mad at you. He's not vengeful. He doesn't want to talk down to you. He wants to love you. He wants to heal you. He wants to remind you that he still has a plan for your life. And if that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer. And that's exactly what it's going to say is just, God, I want to come back to you. And if you can have faith and believe this, God wants to move in your life. I want you to say it with me like this. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Right now, Jesus, I come back to you. Wash away all my sin. Forgive me and restore me. I give you my life. I give you every part of me. Be my Lord, my Savior, and my best friend. In Jesus' name. Now, God, I pray for everyone in the sound of my voice. God, as we, as we leave this series, I pray we will not leave the things you've taught us. Lord, to realize that you are more for us than we can imagine, that you have a plan for our life, and that our job is to simply take the next step and to believe that you can do all things. And Lord, as we continue to do that one step after another, that's how legacies are made, is when we just continue to get back up and to take the next step, and you get all the glory. Lord, we thank you for that in this place, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, let's put our hands together this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the message today and God spoke to you in a special way. And if you did enjoy this message, please consider subscribing, also liking the content as well as sharing with other people. If we can ever do anything for you, please visit our website, experiencerlc.com, or email us at info at experiencerlc.com.